all the scriptures. I looked them all up. You can believe that. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a really deep topic, and it's, uh, it's very difficult to exhaust it. It's, it would take a very, very long time, many, many messages to exhaust this topic, the topic of Jesus Christ and who he is and uh, <clears throat> the fact that he is God. And there's been a lot of debate over the past several centuries about that. Since Jesus died on the cross, there's been lots of controversy about Jesus and, and his deity. And, and I'm going to talk a little more detailed about that word, deity, and, and break it down just a little bit. Uh, the title of the message is, Who Do You Say That I Am? Who Do You Say That I Am? It comes right out of Scripture. Matthew chapter 16. You with me, Manuel? Matthew chapter 16. Verses 13 through 18, that's going to be my theme passage. I'll probably only read it this one time through the whole message, but that is what it's going to all center around. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And I believe that that really is the most important question of all. It's not so much who everyone else says that Jesus is. It doesn't matter what, who your, uh, what your pastor says uh, about who Jesus is. It doesn't matter what your parents said, you know, how you were raised. You know, and that has a huge influence on what we believe about that question. You know, we all have roots. We all have a church back. Well, some of it, most of us have a church background, you know, a history with church. And, and so that has to be formed and it has to come from somewhere, from something. And we have to validate why do we believe what we believe about who Jesus is or anything else for that matter in the Bible. Okay. Now, back in the text, verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And verse 16, and Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. Yes. An amazing answer. I mean, come on, could there really be a more perfect, more on target, I mean, directed, streamlined, arrow shooting through the air, strike the target? That was the answer. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now verse 18 is, is also the source of a big debate and controversy between uh, denominations. And I'm not going to get deep into that, but I do want to clarify verse 18. The rock that Jesus was speaking of, the rock that Jesus is building his church still today on, is the revelation that Peter had that, yeah. that moment yeah. in time. The revelation that Jesus, you are the Christ, meaning you are the anointed one. You are the Messiah. You are the one that all the prophets and all the men of God beforehand prophesied and spoke of. Jesus, that's who you are. And he went on just a little bit further and he said, your son, you are the son of the living God. And so some uh, sects, uh, false Religions have gone as far as to say that all that it says there is that he's the son of God, but it doesn't say that he is God. We're going to unpack this a little bit and we're going to get a little bit deeper and I'm going to break down some of that. We're going to talk about him being the son of God. Okay, this is very important. It really is important to our faith. What we believe about Jesus, who we believe that he truly is. One thing that I'm pretty sure that we all do agree on here tonight and that everyone is very clear and understood about is that Jesus is our source. He is the source of all power. He's the source of all authority. He's a source of salvation. And it comes through the means of his cross. Not the two pieces of wood, as Matt is always, you know, he says it a lot. Not just the two pieces of wood, not just the whip that went across his back when he was scourged and he was tied to the whipping post, but it was the whole an all-inclusive event of what happened from the moment that he began to become crucified and tormented and take the pain and take the sin and take all of our garbage he took upon himself. That right there 
is what I'm talking about. Who do you say that I am? That's what Jesus is asking us. He's asking us today. Who do you say that I am? And I'm sure most of you have already answered that question. But I want to go a little bit further. You see, why do you believe? Why do you believe what you believe about who Jesus is? What's the reason why you believe that? What was it that convinced you? Or who was it that convinced you? And then how can you prove it? You know, I used to think that that really wasn't that important early in my adulthood of my Christian faith. Meaning that when I was around 19, 20 years old, I started to run into some people that started to challenge my faith. Some of the simplest things, such as this topic right here. And I didn't think it was really that important to know how to explain, to know how to give a reason for the hope that was in me. I couldn't really break it down. I knew it was true. I knew in my heart. I knew him deep in the deepest part of who I was. And that really is one of the most, very most important things that you can have is just to know and to have the confidence because you've connected with Christ because he's Lord of your life and because you live for him and you pray and you commune with him. Yes. That is a huge part of it. Yes. But there are people out there that do not believe that. And many other simple truths foundational truths in God's word that we know to be true. They challenge it. Yes, and is it okay with you to go to come into contact with someone like that and walk away from a conversation or a debate feeling defeated, feeling like you didn't convince them of anything, you didn't give them anything to chew on, you didn't plant any seeds of doubt toward their false faith? Does that bother you like it bothers me? It bothers the dickens out of me. And the first real um, huge struggle that I had was actually when I was 19 years old. And I was working uh, offshore for Tidewater Marine and I ran into an atheist on that boat. And uh, he really challenged me. He challenged my faith. He challenged the very core of my being and who, who I believed that, that I was as a believer, as a Christian, a follower of Christ. And I thank God for that encounter. I thank God that I ran into him or he ran into me or something like that. There was a, a real big collision. It was like a freight train when it came. It was like a freight train coming right against my faith and, and what I believe. Because I had to somehow figure out how can I prove to this guy? How can I tell him that Jesus is? He is the Son of God and he is God. And heck, he didn't even believe that there was a God. And so I had somehow to prove to him to show him some evidence, some proof. And so my life just goes on from there, from 19 years old, and, and running into other people, different people of other faiths, other beliefs, lots of heresy that I ran, ran into, lots of misconceptions that I just ran into. Some of my faith was misconceptions that had to be tweaked, that had to be, had to be confined, refined, and, and brought to more of a true... Um, a true... Uh, alignment with God's word. And so, who do you say that I am? The question is, who does the Bible say that Jesus was? Me personally, I believe from scripture, from what I see in scripture, that Jesus fits the description of deity. He fits the description of divinity. And not everybody necessarily knows what that is and what is the difference between deity and divinity. Deity refers to who God is. Deity refers to who he is as a person. But divinity refers to what he does, what he's capable of, how he operates, his works, the attributes of God, the personality, all the characteristics that define, or, or should I say describe, his person or persons, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and so deity, just to clarify, deity refers to who God is. Okay. So when we say deity, that's what we're talking about. This is God. We could be talking about the Holy Spirit. We could be talking about Jesus. We could be talking about the Father. We're talking about God. Okay. But when we say divinity, it talks about the attributes of God and what he does. Okay, and the first big point that I really, I think I made a few good big points already, but the first uh, point nailed in my message here is who Jesus is has been accurately recorded. 
It's been accurately recorded. And what he said and what he did. In what he said and in what he did. It's already been accurately recorded. Did you realize, did you know that there are nine ancient sources inside and outside of the Bible that testify to Jesus, to his resurrection, to his death and his resurrection? Okay? There's nine that are... I'm talking about it includes the ones that are inside and some that are actually outside. Just ancient antiquities, you know, historical writings from men that lived in that day that were there. Josephus being a good example of one. But out of the nine, there's four that we call the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? And so a lot of people would like to come against that. Well, but you know, that that's, that's your Christian, that's part of your Christian collection of of books, you know, you call the Bible. But something to be understood about what went on in that day and in that time is all of those who wrote those books, those four, just talking about the Gospels, either they were eyewitnesses or they were directly connected with not just one, but several eyewitnesses. I'm talking about the 12 apostles who were with Jesus day in and day out. Night and day, day and night. They were with him all the time. Had a connection. Luke was a physician, right? Luke was not one of the original apostles. He was truly a disciple. He was a follower of God. But he was not there day in and day out like the disciples were. He was a physician. And so there's something that comes with that office is that he was very detailed. When Luke wrote, if you compare Luke to Matthew, Mark, and John, you see a certain kind of detail in Luke that you just don't quite see in every single story of Matthew, Mark, and John. But Luke was not an apostle, so how does he qualify for his writings? Because he, when you read Luke chapter 1, starting in the very first verse, it talks about the eyewitnesses that he had direct contact with. Luke gave a really good account of the birth of Christ, of how it went down with Mary and Joseph. He gives a great explanation of how it went down. How did he get that? He wasn't there. He had a connection with Mary. He knew Mary. He had conversations with me. You understand? And so John and Matthew, they were actual apostles. They were with Christ. And so they saw firsthand. But what about Mark? Mark was not an actual apostle, but Mark, was he was a disciple, uh, someone who studied and learned under Peter. He learned under Peter. And so Mark could more accurately, according to Bible scholars, could be more accurately named as the gospel according to Peter. Because Peter was sharing it orally, and that was a very Jewish thing. It was very Jewish not to write things down so much, but verbalize it, verbalize it over and over again. Be very repetitious, over and over, until it's memorized. And when it's memorized, got it. But the problem was, as they got older and older, they started to realize we thought when Jesus said he was coming back, we thought it was going to be like in five years, 10 years. OK, 20, 25, 30. We're really stretching it. But we really thought he was going to come back sooner than that. And they realized we've got to start getting this written down. This has got to be scribed. And so Mark knew it. He knew the gospel, according to Peter. OK, he knew it. He, he scribed it and he wrote it. He was able to do that effectively and efficiently because of his connection in following after uh and studying under Peter. Okay? And so Colossians 2.8. Can you go to Colossians 2.8 for me, please? Who Jesus is has been accurately recorded. Colossians 2.8-10. through 10. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. That's powerful. Yes. That is powerful. Did you really catch that? It says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. Dwells means, when he says dwell, it means to house permanently. This is not something that Jesus just got later on in life. No, he permanently always was. Before he was even born on earth, he always was. He always embodied the fullness of the Godhead. Amen. 
Okay? And Godhead literally means, if you look it up in the Greek, it means the state of being God. I mean, can it get more clear than that? The state of being God. That's what Godhead means, okay? Sometimes we run into some of these words, especially in the King James, and it can really, you know, cause a little stumble and a trip up. And he says, and you are complete in him. It simply means when he says complete, he satisfies, Jesus satisfies all in us as believers that is lacking. Everything that is missing, he satisfies it. He meets it. And so getting back to where he was talking about, don't let any man spoil you through the vain philosophy, through philosophy and vain deceit. And after the, after the tradition of men, it's not tradition in general that he's coming against. He's coming against those traditions. Have you realized that we have traditions in our church services? What do we always do first? The very first thing that we do when we come to church. Pray. We pray. We have some announcements first and then we'll pray. Prayer is the, the spiritually, the, you know, <clears throat> prayer is actually the first thing that we do. And then we always go right on in from there. We'll go into worship or praise and worship, singing. It's tradition. It's what we do. It's something you can count on. It's cookie cutter predictable. We know we're going to do that. We're going to hear the word of God. We're going to hear the preaching of the word. It's tradition, but it's good tradition. It's not just the tradition of men. It, it's, a, it's a good and a holy tradition that God has ordained for us. It's, and God moves through. Amen? Amen? So the Bible is our greatest source. Although there are, are documents and there's antiquities, there's historical documents outside of the Bible that are available and accessible to us to, to show and to prove and, and to let us see that Jesus did live, that he was on earth, and, and that he was more than just a man, that he is God. We have the Gospels. And the thing is, with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them were surrounded by a whole community. There was a whole community surrounding them that could help to hold them accountable. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were not able to just spew out just any old thing, okay? Because a lot of those miracles that Jesus performed, a lot of those teachings that Jesus administered, there were hundreds of other people that were around to witness that. You understand? So when people come against, you know, our Bible, come against the four Gospels, the accounts of Jesus, that's really not a strong argument. It's really not. If you understand anything about the culture of the Jews, if you understand anything about how things were back then, even to some degree how it is today, that's not something that they would ever get away with. There would have been a major uproar among the Jews, among the ones that were believers, the ones who really believed in Jesus. If they were distorting anything, if they were not uh, portraying anything accurately, those who were there would have come forward and said, no, this is not right. There would, there would have been riots in the streets about the, the writings of the Gospels. But instead, there were riots about other things going on back then. You understand? Because Jews are very passionate about documentation. They're very passionate about accuracy. And that's just the way God designed and intended it for them, was that when they would, do, uh, when they would share information and knowledge with each other, it was oral. It was spoken. And it was memorized. No, um, no rabbi was allowed to speak or to preach or to teach until he had memorized the passage that he was actually going to speak on. I can tell you right now, that would disqualify me right away. Right away. I memorize a few verses here and there. How many of you know John 3.16? <laughs> okay, so the four Gospels and their witnesses to Christ. The apostles and the eyewitness accounts. It's an amazing and powerful witness. It's an amazing witness to who Jesus is, to what we have, to who we have, to put it a little bit better. Okay, but with all that, there were was, there was some things that were really coming against the early church after Jesus had died. He rose from the dead. He ascends up into heaven. Uh, the apostles start to pass away. Actually, all the apostles at this point in history, they're, they're dead and gone. And now you have some of the followers and then, you know, you getting into the third, the fourth century. And so now there's some major heresy that's starting to arise. Major heresy. 
Sometimes it starts very subtle and it's something very small and it kind of festers and grows like leaven, you know, and it becomes something more significant. And there was a particular guy who is guilty, who was and is guilty of this very thing. His name is Arius. And Arius was a pastor of one of the churches in Alexandria in Egypt. Okay, so he was over that local gathering. But there was a bishop that was over that whole area, that whole region in Egypt or in Alexandria. And his name was Alexander. And, Al and Alexander recognized that there were some things that Arius was teaching and that he was spreading that was not right. It was not biblical. It was not scriptural. And just to let you know exactly what, he was challenging the church on John 1.14. He was saying that Jesus was not eternally God and that he was created into his existence. He tried to make Jesus out as if he was only, he was nothing more or less than just a divine hero rather than actually being God. And he was, he was a pastor of a church and he's teaching this. And you have to understand where a lot of these new converts that were coming into the church, they were, a lot of them were coming from Gnosticism. And not, it really went hand in hand with a Gnostic's beliefs. And so <clears throat> it makes you question, you know, was there truly a conversion there, you know? And so, so he challenges them on John chapter 1, verse 14. Let's start in John chapter 1, verse 1. And then we'll go from there. We'll probably skip a few and go down to where... We'll, we'll read uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Is everybody there yet? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Are you catching that? Yes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay? Now, there's a lot of good stuff here, but um, for the sake of time, because I've already been rebuked before I got up here. <laughs> Let's go to verse 14. There's good reason for it. I understand. I, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, we interpret and we perceive and we see and we know that the Word is Jesus. Amen. Right? Amen. The Word is Jesus. The Word was made flesh and He dwelt among us. This is not just words on a piece of paper. It's a person, right? It's, it's, this is someone. And so he became flesh. In other words, he already existed. It's not that he was just then created into being, into existence. No, he always existed. In fact, it says right here that he was with God in the beginning. But why is there a distinction? Or, and, and it goes on to say that uh, he was begotten of the Father. Okay, And so that was one of the, that was one of the little things in there that Arius took and twisted. And said, oh, okay, so he was begotten. He was born. He was created. He was made. And so he's running with that, okay? And that, that's, that's where the heresy, that's where it comes in. And I know that you might be listening to all this and thinking, my God, Aaron, you know, why in the world are you getting that deep into that? I'm currently in the midst of several email debates with someone about this. People believe this stuff. There's people out there. And all I'm saying is that we need to know who it is that we believe in. We accept him as Christ. We accept him as Lord. But we accept him as Lord God. You know, we accept him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we should be able to, in some fashion, in some way, be able to present our faith and say, no, this is the reason. For the hope that's in me. This is the reason I believe what I believe. You know, I'm not here just to see that me and my, my little small circle around me 
go to heaven, you know, but I want everyone that I come in contact to hear the gospel, to, to be exposed to it, whether it's just in the way I live my life or, or if there's that good opportunity where I can really share some words with them, you know, and so it is important. And, and right now this debate, it, it just, it just seems like it's going on and on and on, but it's, it's teaching me a lot. And I, I love it. You know, I'm not against it. You know, uh, I think it's a great thing. I like to debate over the things of God in a positive way, you know, not in an ugly, um, despicable way. So he challenged the church on that verse, verse 14. Okay. Arius challenged the church and, um, from his following came some others a little bit later. And so they said, okay, what, what the, the church as a whole, the Christians, the ones who were truly sticking to the truth, sticking to the word, they were saying, no, God is one substance. He is one God. Okay. In the old Testament, you, there's scripture that talks about God is one God. Okay. He is one substance. He is one unit. He is one altogether. He is one. He's one. He is one, Amen. but he, com he's comprised of three persons. Okay. And all three make one. How can this be possible? I know some of you have heard Matt give, you know, the illustration of an egg and, and maybe you've even heard an illustration about water. You know, you've got steam, you've got uh, like vapor, you've got the liquid, you know, the solid ice, you know, and all three are water and, and have three different personalities, characteristics of the same, uh, original water. But I've heard of one even uh, since then that I, that I like even more than those, and, and it helped me a lot, and I shared it with y'all just the other day. Um, one of the best examples and illustrations is the sun, S-U-N, the sun, the sun, the star in the sky. When you look at the sun, what do you see? You see brightness. You see something that will absolutely blind you. If you look at it long enough, you'll lose your sight. Permanently, You can be blinded, right? And what we see is, is a good example when you look and you see the brightness. That's a good example of Jesus and, and the role that he plays in the Trinity. He's the one that we see. He's the one who became clothed in flesh, came down to earth and revealed himself for everyone to see and to know and to understand not just who Jesus is, but who God is, who the Father is. What, he, what is he all about? And what about this mysterious, seemingly mystical Holy Spirit? What's, what's up with that, you know? And so each one is a person of God. And so we can also see the, the or not see, but we know the heat, the warmth that comes from the sun. It's a good representation of the Holy Spirit. It's what we feel, okay? We're affected by what we feel. It touches our emotions. It touches even, it speaks to our mind. It speaks to our heart when we're touched in that way. And so the Holy Spirit can easily be illustrated through the heat, through the warmth that comes from the sun. But at the same, you can't see it, but you feel it, right? I can't see the Holy Spirit, but I feel him, okay? And in the same way, also, there's the ultraviolet rays that affect me. I can't feel them. I can't see them, but they do very much affect me. And they exist. And that's a good illustration there of the Father. Yeah. It's a good example. Just, just a, a, an earthly way to try, you know, feebly to break it down. You know, it's, it's so hard to do. It's so hard to, to describe the complex <laughs> unity of God. And that's the way that I like to refer to it. I believe in the Trinity. You know, we as the, in this church, we believe in the Trinity. But another way to say it is the tri-unity of God, because he is one, as the Old Testament teaches us. He is one God. It's the tri-unity. All three in one. They're all in unity. They are all together. Don't be confused. Don't be confused. Look, we're human, and it's, it's very difficult, and it's very normal for it to be difficult for us to wrap our heads, to wrap our minds around who he is and this complex unity that he carries with him. I mean, what do you expect? You know, this is God. This is the one who created us. He created the worlds, the heavens, the earth, and six days and everything. He spoke it into existence. So what they were saying in the church in Egypt and in that area in Alexandria was that one substance. The best way that we can sum it up, God is one substance. And the way that that word was spelled was very similar to a twisted way that they tried to come back at him. And they said, 
No, we're going to say the guys that, that came up down from Arius, you know, some followers who started their own little gathering, they put a little twist on it and said, no, we're not going to say that he's one substance. We're going to say he's similar. Jesus is similar. You see the deceitfulness of that? You see how, how leaven, you know, how that leaven just kind of got in there? And then they ran with it. They ran with it. It's good to number the pages of your notes when you preach, y'all. <laughs> or, see, I don't want to just throw this down. I might, wait, well, i got to refer back to something. I don't want to lose it. No, anyway, I'm sorry. Let me stay on. Let me stay on. <laughs> okay. The struggle with this Arius guy, y'all, it was real. It was real. It was him and it was, it was a few others like him that was the main reason that the emperor of Rome, Constantine, I know you've all heard of Constantine, uh, not just Bible scholars, but historians consider Constantine to be the first quote-unquote self-proclaimed Christian Roman emperor. Now, <laughs> Whether he was truly Christian or not, I'm not trying to play judge or not. But I can tell you one thing, God used him. God used him in, in, a, in a variety of different ways, okay? And I'm sure the devil used him too. But God used him, okay? And I'm going to show you how God used him. How can this be? How can this be possible that God used Constantine? Well, there was a lot of division in the church. I mean, you saw what was going on with Arius and Alexander, you know, and there was a big, huge conflict. It was causing riots in the streets. It was a big, huge struggle. And so because of that, Constantine being the emperor in Rome, he said, look, I don't know how we're going to do this, but somehow we have got to iron this out. We have got to get this settled. And so he called as many local pastors, regional bishops or whatever they were calling themselves, brought them together to a council and they met in a place called Nicaea. And so I'm sure some of you have heard of the Nicene Creed. And so in, in that gathering, it, it wasn't just a one day thing, y'all. It wasn't just one hour. I mean, this took days and days and days. I mean, it took a very long time and it just seemed, Constantine was like, man, I, it, I don't know if we're getting anywhere with this, but we have got to nail this out. And he said something I thought was so good. He said, Division in the church is worse than war. Amen. Division in the church is worse than the shedding of blood between one nation and another nation or a civil war as we've seen here in our country. And I was like, wow, man, that's really good. That's really good. Yeah. And so he put such an emphasis, again, you know, whether he was truly genuinely converted to Christ or what was he converted to, I don't know. <clears throat> but... Something on the inside of Constantine was like, we have got to get this nailed down. We have got to get some direction. We've got to get some order in the church so as to what we believe. Because if we can't agree on what we believe, there's no way we can move forward with the church. And so in this Nicaea gathering, this group gathering, they formed a creed together. Now in the, in the Bible, we could probably find many, many scriptures that could form much better creed, you know, but, but this is just to sum it up, put it in layman's terms. This is what we believe. And the reason that it's going to be worded the way you can, I'm not reading the whole creed. I'm just reading a part of it to make my point. Okay. The reason they worded it in such a way was to say that we need to all agree and know that Jesus is God. And so this is the part about Jesus that they put in the creed and the creed. It says that we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, God of God, light of light, capital L of capital L, light, very God of very God. I mean, come on, if they're not reiterating what they just got finished reiterating, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Very God of very God, begotten, not made. They made that very clear. He was not created. He always was. He's eternal. Jesus never was created. He was clothed in flesh. Just like he puts, you, you put on a jacket and take it off. He put it on and then he took it off. Okay? That's exactly what happened. 
And then it goes on to say, after he says, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. So there's an obvious problem with Arius and his belief. Let's look at Isaiah 42 8. There's some things that we're going to quickly, <coughs> Lord help me, we're going to quickly look at. Isaiah 42 8. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. I'm just trying to make a point. He says he's not giving his glory to anyone else. Okay, you got that? John 2.11. John 2.11 talks about manifesting forth his glory. Is that it? This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth whose glory? His glory. And his disciples believed on it. We got a problem already. Okay, let's go to John 17, 24, just in case that wasn't evident enough for anybody. John 17, 24 talks about how the Father gives Jesus glory. Okay, Father, I will that they also whom thou has given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which thou has given me. He didn't give it to himself, which thou hast given me, for thou loved me before the foundation of the world. Okay, if that wasn't enough. Hebrews 2, 9 talks about Jesus being crowned with glory. Okay, I'm going to move through this quickly. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 17. 2 Peter 1. Okay. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Next verse. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Who gave it to him? Who did he receive it from? He received it directly from the Father. John 13, 31 through 32 talks about the Father is glorified in Christ. I love this, man. I've seen this scripture so many times, but I guess not, not so much in this context as I am right now. It says that the Father is glorified in Christ and Christ is glorified in the Father. Check that out. That's really interesting. That really gives a strong, strong support and a, makes a strong case for the Trinity. Makes a strong case for Jesus being God and the Father being God and the two being one because one gives glory to the other. The other one brings glory to, the, to him. It's like, wow, so they, they're inter overlapping each other, giving glory to each other. But yet we just got finished reading in Isaiah 42, 8 that God is not going to share his glory with any other because if he's not God then what in the world is going on here? We've got a huge problem. Okay. Yeah. Modelism. Have you ever heard of modelism? You have? Yeah. Okay. Modelism. Yes. Belief that God is one single person who throughout biblical history revealed himself in three modes or forms. Okay, so basically what the, the thought behind that is, God is just one person. Okay, and so now we're getting over to, to what we were talking about on Sunday after church. That's where it all comes from there. Okay, there are uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims, not Muslims, Mormons, gosh. They, they practice a form, a mild form of modelism, okay. Um, they don't believe that the Holy Spirit is, is an actual person. They believe that he's a force or an energy, just, you know, uh, however they word that. But it's something to that effect. And then uh, the United Pentecostal Church, the United Apostolic. I, I'm not trying to call them out for the sake of slinging mud. That's not at all what this is about, okay? So please do understand. But we need to be very clear about doctrine. We need to be very clear about what we believe and, and, and who we're talking to when we're talking to them. It needs to be very clear, okay? And so uh, oneness, and the, they, they, they have formed some of their beliefs from this idea of modelism. They believe that Jesus is the Father. 
They believe that the Father is Jesus, Jesus is the Father, that they're one. No, not meaning one in the Trinity. They don't believe in the Trinity. They believe there's just one person and that the two there are one. And the same with the Holy Spirit. They believe the Holy Spirit is Jesus and the Father and the Father is Jesus and the Holy Spirit and, and so on, all the way around that. That's what they believe. So the questions that need to be asked, if you ask the right questions, it should be able to trip, trip up that whole idea. Is Jesus his own father? <laughs> if Jesus and the Father's will were identical, then why did Jesus express desire to escape the cup, so asking that the cup would pass from him, but then resigns himself to not his own will, but the will of the Father? So who is the Father? I, that's just confusing. Was Jesus praying to himself when he was praying to the Father? Was Jesus saying, not my will, but my will be done? <laughs> when supposedly... There is only one will involved, right? If you've got, if they're both one and the same. So my second big point in this message is that God the Father and God the Son, they reveal themselves in the Godhead. They have revealed themselves. In Scripture, we can see where they reveal themselves in the Godhead. They reveal themselves distinctly, separately, as God. Jesus is God. The Father is God. And, and, and my focus isn't on the Holy Spirit, but, but I thank the Holy Spirit for being here and, and, you know, helping bring all this together here. But I just, you know, the main focus right now that we're, we're talking about is Jesus. But I do want to make it clear the Holy Spirit is God. So the triunity of God, the complex unity of God. Let's look at Matthew 3.13. Matthew 3.13. Jesus' baptism, okay? And there's parallel, there's parallel passages, Mark 1 and Luke 3, that show, uh, talk about exactly the same thing, okay? But just in a slightly different way. Are you there? Matthew 3, 13. Mm -hmm. I need to start going there on my Bible so it gives people time to turn in theirs. All right, Matthew 3, 13. Then come Jesus from Galilee to Jordan and to John to be baptized of him. But John forbid him, forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill our righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so here we can see the, the complete triunity of God in that one simple picture. We see the Holy Spirit taking on the form of a dove. We hear... We, we see in Scripture where, where the Father was heard speaking from heaven. And then there's Jesus visibly for all the eyes that were there to see. Go down into water to be baptized and come up. And when he came up, the Holy Spirit did his thing. It's an amazing picture and it's really cool because one thing is for sure. Jesus is not a ventriloquist. Amen? Amen. Right? Right? So if there was any question in your mind, if there was any confusion at any point in your life, it's okay. Look, and I, I know I said that kind of jokingly, but honestly, I, I don't want to sound, you know, um, prideful or anything like that. Because some people, you know, they are struggling with something like that. And some people have in the past. And, and, and look, it's nothing against that because it takes time, y'all. It, it takes time to... To see certain things in God's word, there's still a lot of things, you know, that I know that we all probably need to, to come to understand and to see. OK, and so Matthew 17, let's go on. Matthew 17, one through seven. Matthew 17, one through seven, the transfiguration. You remember that story? <clears throat> And after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, John, his brother, and brought them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. 
Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. Okay, and I'm going to stop right there. I went a little bit further than I really needed to, but I'm just trying to make a point again. Here we see Jesus down on earth. The Father speaks from heaven. It's just another example showing Jesus is not a ventriloquist. We already, we already covered that. So we know there's two distinct different wills. There's two distinct different persons. And so my third big point that I want to make, God the Father and God the Son have two different wills. And we can see two separate individual wills in Scripture. And I'm only using one passage to show you. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 will show it, okay? Luke 22, we'll start with verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will, thine will, be done. Folks, it's real simple. It's real simple about the will thing. There's two different wills represented here. And I had grazed over it earlier, you know, but, you know, Jesus in his humanity, Jesus really <laughs> was having some second thoughts about going to the cross. That might be a hard thing for some people to accept, but it's clear that not in his divinity, not in his deity, in his humanity, because he knew what his flesh was about to have to endure. He knew exactly what it was going to entail. And there was a struggle there, y'all. And so that's why he can bear with our infirmities. He can bear with our weaknesses because he has been through some really serious, deep struggle where he was like, okay, Father, if there's any way, if there's just any other way. And the Father said, in a nutshell, no, this is the way. You are going to be that way. And it has to happen through this venue, down this road, and so it shows two distinct wills. And so I want to also make the point that Jesus is Son of God. What, what, does, what does Son of God mean? Because that's been a source of contention for me in debate with people before. And uh, John 5, 17 through 23 makes it very clear what Son of God means there, okay? Makes it very clear. John 5. John 5, Mr. Manuel 17. Has Manuel been doing good tonight? Yeah. He always does good. Behind the sound booth, he always does good. Now, outside the sound booth. <laughs> John 5, 17. We'll just read a few of these verses to 23. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm cutting out a little part of a story. This is what happens. Okay, um, Jesus heals a man, and the man couldn't walk. He told him to rise up and walk. And um, he tells him your sins are forgiven you, okay? And so this is where we're at after that happens. Verse 17, uh, the man goes, uh, before verse 17, the man goes and he tells the Jews what happened, tells the story. You know, he healed me. He told me I was forgiven. And they're like, what? Are you kidding me? And so verse 17, they're accusing Jesus. You know, they're um, coming against him and they're about ready to, to throw down with him. And so Jesus answers them and says, My father works hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For what things soever he does... These also does the Son likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. 
He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which has sent him. Now, Jesus went off the topic, I think, a little bit, but he's Jesus, right? Amen. And he was speaking as the Father directed him. So God is going to say what he feels is necessary. I just want to make it very clear that he was being accused, right, of making himself equal to God. Did you see that? He was being accused. Look in verse 18. Look at the end of verse 18. It said not only did he break the Sabbath, but also he was saying that God was his father, making himself equal to God. Did he deny it? He didn't deny it. And I'm gonna, I'll have you know, this is not the only place that this accusation was made against him. And he never denies it. John, the writer, he never says anything about it. He doesn't clarify just to make sure for the sake of doctrine, you know, want to make sure everyone understands, you know, he's not, got, you know, he's not, you know, he's being accused of this, but that's not really true. No, John's not going to do that. He is God. He is God. Jesus is not going to try to put up some kind of a defense again. You know, no, he knows who he is. He is God and he's not denying it. In no way, no fashion is he. But I want to make the, the other point is that when it says Son of God, capital S-O-N, Son of God, he is saying that he is equal. He is equal with God. He is Son in relationship to the Father. Okay, He is Son only in the sense of that relationship. The Father has the authority and he gives the instructions and the Son executes. He does what the Father wills him to do. Amen? Amen. So, why didn't Jesus just set the record straight? Why didn't John the author do it here? We already answered that. Jesus, the judge, who shares the Father's honor, shares his glory like we talked about earlier, he stood his ground. He stood his ground. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. We're wrapping up here. Are y'all surprised? Colossians 1, 13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image? That will be Jesus. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Okay. And then real quickly, I'm going to read it. Hebrews 1 3 says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty. Who but God is going to sit on the throne of God anyway? You've got the father sitting there. You've got the son sitting there. What right does a non-God person have to sit on the throne of God anyway? And then there's one more that goes, it's very much in agreement. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, I'm just going to read it real quick. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Y'all, he's the image. He is the image of God. If you want to know one of the purposes, he is the image. He's the imprint, the exact stamp. I mean, the exact representation. He is the figure of God. He's what you see when you look at him. When you look at the sun, the S-U-N in the sky, and you see that bright thing right there that's killing your eyes, that is the image of the sun, the S-U-N. But the big capital S-O-N is the image of God. He is the expression. He is the imprint. He is who you can see. He is who you can reach out to. And by way of the Holy Spirit, he reaches back down and touches you. And he meets your need. That's who Jesus is. That's who we serve. And that's what's awesome about the Trinity and the triunity and the complex unity of God. Okay, now in Exodus 33, 20, it talks about it talks about something that could become confusing. It says, and he said, thou cannot see my face. He's talking to Moses. This is God. God's talking to Moses. 
For there shall no man see me and live. Okay. There shall no man see me and live. All right. John 1, 18. We were just in John 1 a little earlier, but let's look at verse 18. Hold up. Wait a minute, John. John just slipped a quick one in there. He said, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. No man has seen God at any time. What is going on here, okay? We're about to have a problem, but we're about to solve the problem. Look at 1 Timothy 6. Hold up. Is there 1 Timothy 6? Oh, I just hit the wrong one. Yeah. Yeah. Just to let y'all know, there is a 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, 14 through 16. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is in, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So we read three scriptures that talks about no one can see, no one has seen God at any time. But yet in Genesis chapter 18 through 19, God, the Lord, translated Yahweh, appears to Abraham in physical form with two others believed to be angels. And Yahweh stays after the two angels go on and he speaks with Abraham. What about all those times Moses and, and his encounter with God, you know? What about all those times God, Moses saw him from the back? Hold up. Wait a minute. I think somebody's already got it. Who's the express image? Jesus. It's Jesus. And so every time that we see an expression, okay, no one has seen God, the Father, at any time, okay? But has anybody seen God, Jesus, the Son? Abraham did. Moses did. Joshua did. You remember Joshua when he saw the, the captain of the army? That wasn't just an angel. That was Jesus. That was Jesus. So how do we explain this problem? That's how we explain it. Jesus is the express image. He is the representative of the God. Head of the Trinity, of the triunity of God. Amen? Would y'all stand with me? Our message must be clear, and it must be completely biblical. If our message can be biblical, then we can work on it being clear. If it's not biblical, then I'm not so sure it can be clear. There's a story I'm going to... It's a very short story. It's a story about a woman who was touring in Europe. And she sent a message through a cable operator to her husband. And this is the message. Have found wonderful bracelet. Price, $75,000. May I buy it? The husband promptly cables back. No. <laughs> comma. Price too high. The cable operator in transmitting the message missed the signal for the comma. Oh. Instead of no comma price too high... She said, no, price too high. No price too high. No price too high. So what did she do? She bought the bracelet. She buys the bracelet. What does the husband do? He sues the company and he wins. It's very important that we be thorough. It's very important that we be articulate. And what we say that we believe. We First, hey, we have to know what we believe before we can be articulate in explaining or expressing what we believe.